Today's Amiga episode is all about proper Amiga classics. Although the last one might be a bit debatable, but we'll get to that eventually. We start off with two quintessential Amiga games developed by Digital Illusions, the same company who later became famous for Rally Sport Challenge, the Battlefield series, Mirror's Edge, and a couple of Star Wars Battlefront games on the PC. Of course, I'm talking about Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies. Pinball Dreams was the first pinball simulator to ever get the realism of gravity and physics to an even remotely believable level. Sure, it's still not perfect, but compared to all the virtual pinball games that were made before that, it was light years ahead. When they were making Pinball Dreams, the rule was to only use elements that real pinball machines would have in order to make the game feel as realistic as possible. Also, unlike most of the earlier virtual pinball games, Pinball Dreams featured four tables, each one with a specific theme. Ignition had a space exploration theme with rocket launching as its primary mission. Steel Wheel involved steam trains and had an Old West look to it. Beatbox had a bunch of music-themed missions. And Nightmare, or Graveyard, whichever you call it, was a horror-themed table, so of course most of us teenagers back then were hooked on that one. Although the graphics and the vast amount of things to find in these four tables was amazing enough to get hooked, the game's high-quality mod soundtrack was what made the experience so much better than any pinball simulator prior to this. Pinball Fantasies followed not many months after the release of Pinball Dreams, but the two games used the same engine, so the only real work was making new tables and music. Again, you got four tables. Partyland, which had a circus slash fairground theme. Speed Devils, with a car racing theme. Billion Dollar Game Show with a TV game show theme based on nothing more than winning money and prizes. And Stones and Bones, which kind of tried to repeat the success of the Nightmare Table from Pinball Dreams, but for me at least it didn't quite catch on as well. Instead, Partyland was what me and most of my friends were hooked on. I remember spending many nights at one of my closest neighbors, playing the Partyland table for hours and scoring hundreds of millions of points when we got really good at it. Even though both Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies have been long since bested by more realistic pinball simulators, it's really the few specific tables that keep me coming back for them. If you're not familiar with these games already, I would definitely recommend you to check them out, but only on a real Amiga. Emulators are not responsive enough, and the other versions just aren't as good. The obligatory racing game for this episode is Ivan Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road. For fans of Atari Super Sprint, it offers nothing particularly new, apart from the new environment and a different upgrade system, but that's enough to make Super Off-Road a very different experience. For Amiga gamers though, it was also a matter of not even having a port of the Atari Classic on the system, so Super Off-Road was the closest thing to it, at least until Indie Heat came along. But Super Off-Road was what we had in our area, and boy did we play it. Although it had a possibility of having three human players simultaneously, I don't think I ever played it with more than one friend. The cracked version in our area was one that had an intro screen, not proper for including here, which always made it fun loading it up. 
and it also featured a cheat mode that you couldn't actually turn on, so you always had infinite credits, enabling you to buy every upgrade at once. Some years later, I played this game so much in one sitting that I even managed to freeze the system during one of the later levels when I nitroed up my truck into a wall. Anyway, Super Off-Road is great nostalgia tripping material for not only the multiplayer aspect and fun memories, but it holds up even today as one of the most playable 4x4 racing games of all time. Of course, it helps to have great graphics and a memorable soundtrack, and every aspect of this arcade port shows the good people at Graphgold gave it everything they had. I'm actually in the process of writing a comparison of this game right now, so I'll add the link to the comparison here when it's done. I have mentioned that I'm not a big fan of football games, or soccer games if you're American. The one exception I do have to this rule is sensible soccer on the Amiga and no other platform will do, mostly because of the sound effects. As with many other football games though, the problem with Sensible Soccer is the vast amount of different versions you can pick from. Not only do you have three versions of the original Sensible Soccer, but there's also the Sensible World of Soccer versions, of which there are six. I have probably played Sensible Soccer version 1.1 the most, and about 95% of the time I have played it has been with my cousin. So, I can't say I have ever actually even tried to play the career mode. Why Sensible Soccer though? Many football fans prefer Dino Didi's Kickoff 2 for being more realistic, which might well be true, but Sensible Soccer is custom built for people like myself who want to enjoy a gaming session for what it is and not put too much value into recreating real life things faithfully in a digital environment. I like the fact that the ball sort of latches onto the player handling it, and I like the small players running around in somewhat unrealistic speeds. I also like how the teams in different leagues, particularly in the later Sensible World of Soccer games, are so clearly different in their speeds and skills. And of course, the title song for Sensible World of Soccer is one of the most memorable ones in the entire catalog of Amiga games. But I have to admit, part of my preference has to do with the fact that it's made by Sensible Software, whose games on the Commodore 64 I grew up with, and continue to play to this day, and their Amiga offerings are just as important in their catalog. Amiga was a great system for quirky platformers, and one of my absolute favorites, and I guess most other Amiga gamers, is Super Frog. It was released in 1993 by one of the longest standing game studios, Team 17, who are still around making new modern classics such as the Overcooked series and the Survivalists. The plot in Super Frog isn't much to talk about. It's the same old Save the Damsel in Distress affair, but it's the huge levels with their secret passages, the excellent cartoony graphics and soundtrack, and the infuriating fruit machine method of getting level codes that makes Super Frog the special game that it is. Gameplay-wise, Super Frog hasn't perhaps aged as well as one would hope, but the slightly awkward jumping mechanics are part of what the game is all about. It doesn't try to be a Super Mario or a Sonic clone, and because of that, it succeeds in being a memorable platformer in its own right. It is a very long game though, as displayed by some of the long plays on YouTube. Even if you know exactly what you're doing, it'll take you above two hours to complete it, and many hours more if you don't. Which is why the level codes are so important, although they should have gone for a save disk option instead. Anyway, Super Frog is a pivotal Amiga experience, and I cannot recommend it enough. The final game for this episode is a rare example of a strategy game that got a lot of attention in my area back in the day. Oil Imperium, also known as Black Gold. 
was originally released by the same company that was responsible for Hard and Heavy, the original sequel to The Great Gianna Sisters. And I would hazard a guess that the game would never have become as well known as it did without piracy. Oil Imperium is an oil business management game in which you basically need to be three other oil companies in four possible slightly different game modes. Most of the game is played from your office where you can use the phone, the computer and the contents in your briefcase to buy and sell oil fields, hire spies to find out more about your competitors and that sort of stuff. There are a few more arcade-like sections in the game where you're given the chance to drill oil, build pipelines and sabotage your competitors' oil fields. All in all, it's a relatively light strategy game, but its lightness and variety in gameplay elements is why it was such a popular game for some of us. Although the game feels very much a 16-bit game, it was also released for the Commodore 64, and it works surprisingly well on it. Elsewhere, you can find the game on PC and Atari ST. Whatever your platform of choice is, Oil Imperium is very much recommended. But the Amiga version is the original and features the original soundtrack from the legendary Karsten Obowski. Check it out. <laughs> 